All right, so we're going to go a little more in depth into um, isotopes and get a little bit more mathematical today. So in this video, be prepared to have a calculator and do some arithmetic or some mathematics with me. So we're looking here at the inside of a device. You don't need to know all the details of this, but it's a very, very expensive instrument that you'll find in um, high-level chemistry labs called a mass spectrometer. You should know the name of this instrument, the mass spectrometer. What it does, this is what you need to know about it, is that it can separate and analyze particles based on their masses. In other words, it can separate a sample of a given element, in this case neon gas, into its isotopes. So the mass spectrometer, if you inject into this instrument, if you inject into the vaporizing oven on the left, a sample of neon atoms, what will happen is the atoms will pass through the vaporizing oven, they'll get hit, they'll um, go into the ionizing chamber that's next, where they get hit by x-rays. That causes them to become little charged neon atoms. The accelerating grid that's next has an opposite charge of the charged neon atoms, so they're attracted to it, so they speed up. Then we have these collimating slits, which are basically circular disks with tiny holes in their centers. As most of the neon atoms, they'll, get, they'll strike the first disk, and that's the end of the story for them. But some of them will pass through that hole in the middle and create a little beam of neon atoms. The second disk will get rid of some more of the neon atoms, and the beam that comes through the second disk is very, very narrow. So what we've done is created a narrow beam of neon atoms. We then pass those things through a magnetic field, a strong magnetic field, and it's kind of like taking a bunch of stones in a, in a little sack, swinging it around your head, and throwing them. It's like a slingshot effect. So what will happen is that the heaviest isotopes of neon, they won't travel very far while the lightest isotopes of neon, they'll travel further. So what you get in the end, in this particular case of neon, you'll see three different um, strikes on the detector at the end. If you were looking at a computer screen, you would see three little peaks on the computer screen showing you that there are three isotopes of neon. This is an idealized example of what you would see on your computer screen. On the x-axis, you should sketch this and give it its name, the mass spectrum of neon. This is what you'd see if you injected neon into the mass spectrometer. So on a mass spectrum, the x-axis is the mass number of the different isotopes. The y-axis is abundance, or the amount of each of those isotopes. Now, if I'm going too fast, feel free to pause the video so you can copy these things down. Now, in the particular spectrum for neon, we can see that there are three peaks. One very large peak at mass number 20, a much smaller peak at mass number 22, and a very, very small peak at mass number 21. So the fact that there are three peaks in the spectrum tells us that we have three isotopes of neon. Now the computer will calculate the area under each of those peaks, and the area represents the percentage of all neon atoms that rep are represented by each of those isotopes. So for example, we see neon 20 is one of the three isotopes, the mass number was 20. The computer tells us that of all the neon atoms that were in the sample, 90.92% of them were neon 20. So almost all of the neon atoms were that isotope. That's why the peak is so tall. The peak that is next tallest, 8.82%, that's the isotope neon 21. So there's almost 10% of the atoms were neon 21. Sorry, neon 22, I misspoke, sorry. And then that third peak, which is at mass number 21. This will be neon 21. Okay, so sorry about that, I misspoke there. That guy has less than 1%. So neon 21 is the least abundant isotope for neon. Most neon atoms are neon 20. There are some that are neon 22. And there are very, very few that are neon 21. 
All right, so understand what that mass spectrum is telling you about neon. Now comes the math. Using the information that we get from the mass spectrum and knowing also the masses of each of the isotopes, not the mass number, but the actual atomic mass, we can calculate what's called the average atomic mass for neon. Right? Now in this case, we're going to look at two different elements. One's rubidium. So rubidium, we're told here, has two stable isotopes. You can imagine the rubidium mass spectrum would have shown two peaks in it. The first rubidium um, peak was at mass number 85. So rubidium 85 is one of the isotopes that we find in its spectrum. The second peak is at 87. Rubidium 87 is the second isotope. We also know that rubidium 85 has an atomic mass of 84.912 atomic mass units. Remember, that's, like, that's as though you would put that isotope on an electronic balance and recorded its exact mass. So 84.912 atomic mass units, AMUs, is the mass of that isotope. The rubidium 87's atomic mass is heavier, it's 86.909 AMUs. Notice that the atomic masses are very close, but not exactly the same as the mass numbers. That's because each proton and each neutron in the atom has a mass very close to one atomic mass unit. So the atomic ma the mass number 85 is very, very close to the actual atomic mass of the isotope 84.912. Now we're told underneath that the of the two isotopes, the rubidium 85 has the higher abundance. So its peak in the spectrum was taller, 72.17% is the abundance of that isotope. Since there's only two isotopes, we can now easily calculate what the abundance of the second isotope must have been. So let's do that. So we're going to calculate now the percent abundance of the second isotope, which would be rubidium 87. Again, we can do this because there's only two, and so they have to add up to 100%. So we take 100% and subtract the first abundance, 72.17%, and we're going to get an abundance. Let's do this on a calculator so we don't screw it up. 72.17, we got 27.83% is the abundance of the second isotope. Now using those two abundances and the two atomic masses up above, we're going to calculate the average atomic mass for rubidium. Now the average mass is, you might think, we'll just take the two atomic masses and add them and divide by two. Well that doesn't work because they're not equally abundant. If they were 50% each in the peak in the mass spectrum, then yes, we could just take the two masses and add them and divide by two. But when one of them is 72% abundant and the other one is almost 28% abundant, then the average mass is going to be much closer to the rubidium 85 because it had a higher abundance. Now, how do we do the average mass? What we're going to do is called a weighted average. Whoops, let me just grab a, the right pen. So the weighted average, or in this case, the average atomic mass, be sure you're writing this down, is going to equal, now watch what we do. We take the abundance of rubidium 85, so 72.17%. So I write it like that as a fraction. 72.17%. If I write it like this, it's converting it back to a decimal. This will be 0 0.7217 when I divide by 100. We take that abundance and we multiply by its atomic mass. So up above, we were told that rubidium 85 had the um, abundance 80, sorry, the mass 84.912. So multiply this by 84.912 AMUs. And then we'll add to that 
the second abundance for rubidium-87 this time, so 27.83% divided by 100, and multiplied by its mass. Up above, the mass of the second isotope was 86.909 AMUs. If there were more isotopes than just these two, we would just continue like this until we ran out. So we're taking the abundance of the isotope divided by 100 to convert it back to a decimal, and then multiplying that by its mass that we were given up above. We add to that the second abundance divided by 100 to convert back to a decimal, multiplied by its mass also. So grab your calculator and see if you can get the average atomic mass of rubidium. So 72.17 divided by 100 times 84.912. The first guy will be 61 point, I'm going to keep four digits here, 61.28. And the second guy, 27.83 divided by 100 times 86.909. That guy gives me, again, with four significant digits, 24.19 AMUs. And now when I add those, I'm going to keep two decimal places in the answer, 61.28 plus 24.19. That gives me 85.47 AMUs, the average atomic mass of rubidium. Now I can check my answer. This average atomic mass that I've calculated should be on the periodic table. Is this the same mass shown on the periodic table for rubidium, Rb? So you can glance at a periodic table. I've got one beside me, and sure enough, 85.47 AMUs is the average atomic mass that's shown on the periodic table for rubidium. All right, so that was one example. If you understand what we just did, try it again with this next example. This time we have chromium. We're told we have not just two isotopes, but four isotopes. And for each isotope, just like for rubidium, we're told the mass of that isotope, and we're told the abundance of that isotope. This question's a little bit easier because we didn't have to calculate any of the abundances. We were told all of the abundances. On the other hand, instead of just two isotopes, it's got four. So it'll be a little bit more messy in your answer. But can you set it up just like we did the average atomic mass for rubidium? Pause the video and give it a try. So the average atomic mass we're going to do exactly what we did before. We take the abundance of the first isotope, 4.35%. We divide by 100 to convert it back to a decimal. And then we multiply by its mass, 49.946 AMUs. We add to that the second abundance, 83.79 over 100 to convert that back to a decimal, multiplied by its mass. 51.941 AMUs. And we're going to continue, but let me just point out that second isotope's abundance is 84%, 83.79, very close to 84%. That means the average atomic mass will be closest to the mass of that isotope. Almost all the isotopes are that isotope. So the average atomic mass will be very close to its atomic mass. So I'm expecting an answer close to 51.94. But let's continue. The third isotope is 9.50% multiplied by its mass, 52.941 AMUs, atomic mass units. And the last isotope, 2.36%, this guy has very, very low abundance, multiplied by its mass, 53.939 AMUs. All right, now last time I 
showed my intermediate multiplications and then I added together to get the answer. This time I'll just do it all in one step on my calculator. So 4.35 divided by 100 multiplied by 49.946 plus 83.79 divided by 100 times 51.941 plus 9.5 divided by 100 times 52.941 plus the last guy 2.36 divided by 100 times 53.939 equals and my calculator gives me an answer of 51.996. I'm going to round that off to two decimals like we did before. And we're going to get 51 point, sorry, 52.00. So 52.00 AMUs is the average atomic mass for chromium. Glance at a periodic table, and sure enough, that is the average atomic mass that we see there. Now if you had rounded off a little bit incorrectly and said 51.99 and then looked on the periodic table and saw 52.00, you'd be fine with that. Okay, You wouldn't have done anything wrong. So there we have it, our first kind of complicated calculation in the course. Make sure you understand how to find the average atomic mass when you're given the abundance of each isotope and the atomic mass of each isotope um, in the question like this. All right, so those are the tougher um, mathematical questions.